Hey YouTube, that Brady chick here. First of all, I want to say y'all really blew up that last video. The one about me talking about my NCLEX resources. Wow, like I didn't expect that, honestly. 4,000 views in two days? I've never gotten that before. That's different. Side note, this is like a new hairstyle that I just did. If you want to check out the video on that, the little tutorial that I have, check the link above. Hopefully I already posted the video, but if not, awkward but yeah anyways that was a side note i know you guys are not here for the hair or anything else but the nclex tips so let's get into it all right so i'm gonna try to go in as organized in order as i can what we're gonna start with is some pharmacology so we're gonna start with the Eans. So the Eans would be those medications that end in I-N-E. So these types of medications are typically, typically, not all of them, but typically they are anticholinergics. What that pretty much means is that they are anti-moisture. When you see the word cholinergic, I want you to think about moisture. I want you to think about secretions. I want you to think about wet. Okay. So anticholinergics, if they're anti-moisture, what's the opposite of moisture? Dryness, right? So in that case, anticholinergics are dry, right? They cause dry side effects. The way Nurse Mike puts it in Simple Nursing, he'll call the anticholinergics anti-secretions. Anti-secretion, like he capitalizes that C to kind of let you know that it causes that dry environment. What I want you to remember when it comes to those ENs, no matter what kind of drug class it is, more than likely, more than likely, not always, but more than likely, if that drug ends in I-N-E, it's going to cause dry side effects. So what are some examples? Atropine, right? Atropine is that heart rate medication that we know is meant to boost the heart rate for um, symptomatic bradycardia. And by symptomatic, I mean bradycardia, low heart rate with symptoms like paleness, cyanosis, things like that. But anyways, that's a different lecture. But yeah, so atropine is actually the number one anticholinergic. Notice how atropine also ends in I-N-E. So we know that atropine causes dry side effects. So what are the dry side effects? I'm just reading off my notes here because I made notes for this video. I was trying to be organized for you guys. The dry side effects would be dehydration, constipation, urinary retention, dry mouth, things like that, right? The ones that we're really, really worried about out of that list would be the urinary retention, right? Because that would lead to infection, that can lead to kidney stones. Why? Because when the pee is just sitting there in the bladder, then it kind of creates that environment for bacteria to go to. When urine is retained in the bladder, it's a reservoir for infection, right? For bacteria. Also, when the pee is sitting in the bladder, the solutes in the bladder would actually solidify and turn into actual kidney stones, right? Because urinary retention definitely does lead to kidney stones, but I'm just trying to remember the pathology behind that. Okay, so I just looked it up and yes, it does actually solidify. So what happens is the urine is retained within the bladder and then it kind of travels up the ureters back to the kidney, which then can lead to kidney infections or urinary tract infections or kidney stones because there's solutes within the bladder that actually does um, concentrate and get more concentrated because they're not leaving the system. They're just accumulating within the body so then that leads to the kidney stones you don't really need to know that much for the exam but it's good to understand why things happen but yeah just remember when you see urinary retention think of infection think of kidney stones so when it comes to constipation and urinary retention i want you to think of both as retaining right because constipation is pretty much when you're retaining poop because the poop isn't coming out so it's like your body's holding onto the poop because it's such a dry environment the poop isn't lubricated enough by the water because there's lack of water in your system if you're taking an ene, right, an anticholinergic, because it dries you out. So then it dries the bowels out. So then now the poop doesn't have that lubrication to actually slip and slide out of the body. So now it's just retained within the body. So now they have constipation. Same thing for the urine. The fact that the body is just dry, it's like the urine can't come out either. So it's almost like you're constipated with urine too, which is pretty much urinary retention. I have weird ways of remembering things. Hopefully that works out for you. But yeah, just think whenever the patient is dry and inside, they're going to retain that um, urine and they're going to retain that poop. Unless it's like diabetes insipidus, that's a different story, but we'll get there. But yeah, so just remember anticholinergics, the enes, they cause the dry. Some other examples of enes would be tetracycline. Tetracycline is not an anticholinergic. What it really is, is an antibiotic, but it ends in ene. So it still causes some dry side effects, like anticholinergic side effects. Tetracycline causes a bit of dehydration, which then leads to the photosensitivity. What does that mean? It means that your body, your skin, 
actually become sensitive to the sun. Photo sensitivity, right? Why? Because tetracycline kind of dries you out. And what does the sun do? The sun also kind of dries you out, right? Because when you're in the sun, you sweat. So you're kind of losing that water, which then makes your body dry inside. So if you pair two dries together, like the tetracycline plus the sun, it's not a good combination, right? So that's why for patients taking tetracycline, we think of photosensitivity. And how do we combat photosensitivity? Well, we tell them wear long sleeves, wear sunscreen, wear a large brim hat just to protect yourself from the sun. We just have to think of ways to protect them in the sun because we have to be realistic. They're obviously going to go out in the sun at some point. So we kind of have to just teach them to kind of do those sun protective things. It also causes some teratogenic effects to the baby. So just remember the cycling, the suffix cyclines, they are not baby safe. Beware of giving it to pregnant ladies. So if a question ever asks you, your patient is 32 weeks gestation and they are asking you about whether or not they should take tetracycline. What is your best response? Your best response would be to educate them and tell them that it is not baby safe and maybe you should take it after the baby is delivered. Or the question may be worded in a way that's like, which of the following statements require the nurse to intervene if the patient who is 32 weeks gestation states? And then A would be something like, I should take more folic acid, which is fine. That's not a wrong statement. B would be something like, I should elevate my feet at night so that the blood can return back to my system instead of just pooling in my legs. That's also not a wrong statement. We typically recommend the feet elevation, especially when they're lying down. C would be something like, I should start my dose of tetracycline. That would be the wrong statement. So we would select that as something that the nurse would have to intervene with. Why? Because it's a wrong statement. The nurse would intervene in a way that's pretty much addressing that issue. Like we're, we have to teach them. When it says nurse has to intervene, that means that we're looking for the most concerning statement or the false statement that requires further teaching. C requires further teaching. And D would probably say something like, I need to increase my calcium and vitamin D intake. Obviously, we're not going to dispute that. So that's a correct statement. What other enes are there? Oh, there's also benztropine. So benztropine is used for Parkinson's. It's meant to help control the tremors. So the way I remember it is, of course, benztropine ends in en, so it does have dry side effects. So benztropine would cause dry mouth. So because benztropine controls those tremors and the pill rolling that the Parkinson's person has, also those are kind of hallmark signs of Parkinson's. So if a question ever asks you which of the following patients are exhibiting signs of Parkinson's, choose the answer that has like the pill rolling, which is literally when they go like this with their fingers, the tremors and the shuffling gait. When they're taking benztropine and it's controlling those tremors, the way I think about it in terms of the function of benztropine, I kind of think of it as the tremors are like a wet environment. Kind of like when there's too many secretions, you start tremoring. With benztropine, it dries you out. So if you're giving benztropine to a patient, it's probably because their secretions or their wet environment might be a little too hot. Just another side note, anytime you give medications to a patient, it's always to reverse whatever they currently have. And in this case, because they have too many secretions, we're going to give them something that's going to make them dry. And if they're too dry, like with myasthenia gravis, then we would give them something to make them more wet if that makes sense. Right? So in order to bring down those tremors, which is that wet environment, we're giving them benztropine to kind of slow them down to the point where now they can actually function better physically. So if a question ever says, which of the following statements represents therapeutic effect of benztropine, the correct answer would be the patient is able to walk around the yard with no difficulty, right? Something like that. Because what we're looking for in that type of question is that the patient's movements are now spontaneous and coordinated instead of tremors, you know? And instead of having difficulty with movement, now the movements are spontaneous and coordinated because that's the therapeutic goal of benztropine. Okay, so the opposite of anticholinergic would be the cholinergic medication. So these are the secretion medications or the wet medications. The stigmines do the opposite of anticholinergics because the stigmines actually increase the secretion for someone who's originally dry. So for example, someone with myasthenia gravis, simple nursing calls it dryasthenia gravis. Why? Because myasthenia gravis causes that dry environment. So they're going to have like the droopy eyelid on one side and they're just going to have other dry side effects. Like they might have low blood pressure. They have difficulty swallowing. I like to think it's because there's lack of lubrication 
location within the esophagus because they're dry with dry asthenia gravis. So because of that, now we have to give them stigmine in order to increase those secretions and allow them to be able to swallow with less difficulty. That's why we give them stigmine. I got this question on one of my practice tests, not the NCLEX, because I'm not going to disclose any NCLEX questions because that's a legal issue and I'm not trying to, no. Absolutely not. One of my practice questions did say, which of the following medications are priority to give first? And then there was Tylenol to someone with pain of five out of 10. Or sorry, it's not gonna say Tylenol, by the way. It's gonna use the generic name, which is acetaminophen. No, you wouldn't go to them first. They can wait. <laughs> sorry, beta blockers to someone with a blood pressure of 142 over 88, they can wait too. Oh, antibiotics to someone who has pneumonia, they can wait too. I know it's a respiratory issue, but they, they can wait. And then D would say something like pheostigmine to a patient with myasthenia gravis who is currently reporting difficulty swallowing. At that point, that's an airway issue. The pneumonia, yes, it's a respiratory issue, but it's a breathing issue. So what takes precedence? Is it airway or is it breathing? Is airway. Okay, so if that patient with dry asthenia gravis now has difficulty swallowing because of their dry esophagus, sorry, I'm extra. <laughs> Just want to like get this through your heads because I had to myself to get it through my head. If that patient with dry asthenia gravis is reporting that difficulty swallowing, we immediately think that this is now an airway issue because the esophagus is essentially part of the airway. We will give them that pheostigmine first so that their airway can be protected. They are the priority in that case. Okay, there are extreme side effects with both the anticholinergics and the cholinergics. So we have something called an anticholinergic crisis. Now this is when those side effects of the dryness that anticholinergic causes, like the dry mouth, the constipation, the urinary retention, the dehydration, if those side effects get severe to the point where now the person is in hypotensive shock because the anticholinergic has dehydrated them to the point where their blood pressure is like in the 80s, like 80 over 50 or 60. That should alert you to shock. This is something really useful that I learned from one of my teachers too. If you ever see a patient's blood pressure, the top number is in the 80s, think shock. But in the NCLEX world, you want to have those red flags kind of going off in your head when you see any blood pressure lower than 90 over 60. That just means, okay, they're going towards hypotensive shock at this point and we need to address their circulation. The constipation is even worse. Now they have fecal impaction and the urinary retention is so bad to the point where now they have potential UTI or even kidney stones. In that case, we have to give them something that's gonna cause wet because right now they're extremely dry. So now we gotta cause the wet. So we give them a stigmine, which will then reverse all of that. You wouldn't give them epinephrine or any Thing. No, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't give them fluid first. No, because we know what the source is, we're going to stick to giving them a stigmine because we know that this person is in anticholinergic crisis. But keep in mind, if the question does not say that this patient is taking an anticholinergic, like something ending in en, then we can resort to giving them fluids first, right? Because at that point, we know that they're suffering from some type of fluid deficiency that we don't know the cause of. So we're just going to give them fluids, right? Because that is priority at that point. But if the question says the patient has been taking atropine for X amount of time and now they've been constipated for seven days, which is really excessive, and they urinate maybe 12 mils an hour. That's way too low. We want at least 30 mils an hour, but the normal really is 50 to 60 mils an hour just so you know, but at least 30 we'll, we'll be okay with. But 12 mils an hour, you know that pee is being held within their body. It's not going out, it's not going anywhere. So urinary retention, prolonged constipation, and they're on atropine? Come on now, put those dots together because all those things are related to each other. So the fact that they mention atropine, immediately you want to think of anticholinergic crisis. Why is it a crisis? Because they're constipated for greater than four days. Side note again, if the patient is constipated for more than four days, that's not normal. If they haven't had a bowel movement for two or three days, it's iffy, but we can allow it. But in the NCLEX world, if it's greater than four days, it's a red flag. Just think of it that way. So at that point, we would choose the answer choice 
that says to give them a stigmine in order to reverse that anticholinergic crisis because clearly they're taking an anticholinergic medication. If they are in a cholinergic crisis, that means there's too much wet going on. So that means they're vomiting a lot. There's a lot of diarrhea. There's a lot of pee coming out, the polyurea. It's just excessive for like how many days. And the question states that they're taking a stigmine and it mentions all those other symptoms of the wet environment, like the vomiting, the diarrhea, the polyurea, the lacrimation, which is like, I think it's like excessive tearing of the eyes. Give them an anticholinergic because at that point we want to reverse the wet with a dry, right? So the anticholinergic is now going to dry those things up and bring them back to normal because right now they're excessive secreting all those materials. So let's switch over to some antibiotics now. Don't get tricked by the NCLEX. Like, just remember that if the patient has a bacterial infection, give them an antibiotic. Just think of antibiotic. B stands for bacteria. Antibiotic, give them to bacterial infections. So don't give antivirals to a bacterial infection. Not gonna do anything for it. So antibiotics are for bacterial infections. Antivirals are for viral infections. For example, antibiotics like penicillin, the very famous antibiotic that everyone and their mom is allergic to. Penicillin give those to bacterial infections. Typically it's for syphilis, which is a bacterial infection. And for syphilis, penicillins are actually non-negotiable. Like you actually have to give it to them, even if they do have an allergy to penicillin. If you ever get a question like that, it's pretty rare, but I did get a question like that in my question bank like my practice test and the answer was pretty much to desensitize the patient to penicillin so that they kind of are not so much at risk of allergic reactions to the penicillin. That was the answer. It was from you world. Yeah, but that stayed with me because I'm like, oh, interesting. Like it's really non-negotiable when it comes to syphilis. Antivirals, like anything ending in vir, V-I-R, would be antivirals. Tenovir would be used to treat something like HIV. So HIV is human immunodeficiency virus. It's a virus. That's what the V stands for. That's why we would give the antiviral to the virus. And so don't get tricked by the NCLEX. So if your patient has, for example, bacterial meningitis, keep in mind also for bacterial meningitis, the main, main, main sign that you will see your question banks would be nuchal rigidity. Pay attention to that because they won't always say nuchal rigidity. They, they'll they know. They'll know that you know your stuff. But they'll try to kind of like trick you and, and call it something else that means the same thing. Neck stiffness. Or they'll say that the patient can't flex their neck to their chin. If they can't flex their neck to the chin, then the neck is stiff. Automatically, you're thinking, oh, nuchal rigidity. And if they mention that their temperature is high, like over 100 or over 100.4, which is usually that sepsis region and over 104 would be septic shock. If that temperature is really high paired with that neck stiffness and it's more than likely bacterial meningitis. And at that point, they would have to do a lumbar puncture, kind of curve up in the fetal position on the bed. I'll show a picture over here maybe. And they get a needle to the spine and then they kind of aspirate, which means to withdraw that fluid. And then they're looking at the CSF. I think it's for antibodies. Pretty much lumbar punctures are used to diagnose, not treat, but diagnose bacterial meningitis. So yeah, bacterial meningitis is a bacteria, so it's gonna get an antibiotic. Just know your antibiotic names. Again, simple nursing really helps with that. He has a full video on antibiotics if you wanna check it out. I will link it down below, so don't get confused, okay? Just pay attention to the description box. Oh yeah, also the cyclines, like tetracycline, doxycycline, those are also antibiotics, right? So they end in E, so they cause a bit of those dry side effects, like the anticholinergic side effects. So again, photosensitivity, because it dries you out. It's also used for acne, although I don't think the NCLEX will test you about that. And of course, it's not baby safe. I just think cyclines, they're eons, so they kind of dry you out a bit. And if the mom is dried out, she'll have low blood pressure, which then means low blood flow to the baby, which is not good for baby. That's why we don't give tetracyclines to mom. Then there's villains, which I mentioned before. More than likely, because I got this on every single question bank that I had, you may get a question that says, a patient is about to be prescribed penicillin, or it may they say ampicillin or something else that ends in cillin. Just know that that's the penicillin category, okay? What is the best response by the nurse? For the best response, the main thing you want to focus on would be allergies, right? But it's not always going to say that directly. It's not always going to be like, oh, do you have any allergies to penicillin? Because that'll be easy. You'll just be like, well, yeah, let's ask that. Sometimes NCLEX will try to trick you, and I think we all know this. It won't always say ask about allergies. It may say something like ask about 
what the reaction was like after taking penicillin because sometimes they can have something as small as like a mild rash after taking it versus something as severe as a really swollen throat which then is an airway issue where they had to like be rushed to the emergency department right after taking penicillin that means that's a severe allergic reaction to penicillin and then at that point we have to prescribe something else like a different antibiotic unless they have syphilis then it's like uh, we gotta desensitize them somehow i don't know how but again that was the answer for that U World Q Bank. So, or it may even say something like, Do you have any first degree family members? So, first degree family members would be like parents, siblings, kids. Those are all first degree. Aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa. Those are not first degree. Those would be second degree, I believe. Though so they don't count, okay? I'd just be like, Hey, did your mom ever have a certain reaction to penicillin? Because that's also a way of assessing their risk for penicillin allergy, too. Just always think, if you see the word penicillin in the question, automatically think potential for penicillin allergy. Also, keep in mind that CEPHs, ceftriaxone, cephalosporin, Keflex. So CEPHs are very chemically similar to penicillin. So if a patient is allergic to penicillin, do not give them any type of CEPHs. Don't give them cephalosporin, don't give them ceftriaxone because they're pretty much the same as penicillin. So that's rule of thumb. If they're allergic to penicillin, they're also allergic to CEPHs by default. Also keep in mind that CEPHs can actually cause C. difficile, which is that contact precaution type of super infection, right? Because it's an infection that's really hard to get rid of. So you'd actually have to treat it with the mycins, which I'll get into. But yeah, C. diff can be caused by Ceph. And the way you can remember that is that both of them start with C. I think it's Ceph that's taken for a prolonged period of time. It causes C. diff. The hallmark sign of C. diff would be those frequent watery stools. So if you see a question that says that the patient has X amount of stools per day that have all been watery and frequent, think C. difficile. And apparently they also smell very bad. The worst smelling poop you've ever encountered. I've never had a patient with C. diff during any of my play so I really don't know and to be honest I don't really want to know but it's gonna be inevitable because I'm about to start working in hospital soon anyway <laughs> also back to the mycins so mycins are those strong antibiotics right so we have gentamicin we have tobramycin we have vancomycin and we have streptomycin so all of those are aminoglycosides although I think vancomycin kind of falls into its own subcategory but it's, it's all good just look at the mycin and immediately think that these are very strong antibiotics and thus they cause very severe side effects. So they're the ones that are going to fight those super infections like C. diff, like VRE, which is that vancomycin resist- ooh, vancomycin resistant. Oh, I didn't even take that in. It's resistant to vancomycin? That's not good. That's why it's a super infection. But anyways, so VRE, that vancomycin resistant enterobacteria, something like that, because it affects the GI, but so does C. diff. C. diff also affects the GI because it causes those watery stools. Poop comes from your GI system, so it affects the GI. Anyways, <laughs> and then there's also MRSA, that methicillin resistant super something. I don't even know what that stands for, girl, but I know it's methicillin resistant, okay? So yeah, those are the super infection that we would typically use those strong antibiotics to to fight. Why? Because these infections are super resistant, right? Regular antibiotics would just not cut it. So we have to give them those stronger antibiotics to try to really eradicate that infection, which means get rid of it. The thing is, they are strong, but they cause severe side effects, like I mentioned before. So the severe side effects would be, again, because they're mean old mycin, they cause those ear problems. So you might have tinnitus, which is that ringing in the ear, which actually makes it hard for the patients to be able to hear you. So I had this really interestingly worded question question on one of my practice tests and it was saying something like a patient is taking vancomycin IV walk into their room and you notice that they are exhibiting side effects of the medication if and the answer was pretty much that the patient is unable to hear what you're saying and what that answer choice implied was that they're now experiencing that ringing in the ears so much so to the point where it looks like they're ignoring you because they can't hear what you're saying because they're experiencing that side effect from the vancomycin you ever get a question like that always pay attention to the the details because I never believed this before but the question really does help you answer the question <laughs> like they put enough details in the question to help you kind of guide your thinking because why would they tell you the patients on vancomycin automatically if you see any of the mycins you should think about those two major side effects of the ear issues and the kidney issues with the kidney issue think creatinine greater than 1.3 just like simple nursing says if the creatinine is greater than 1.3 it's a bad kidney and if the BON is greater than 20 
that's also bad. Yeah, B1 greater than 20 it does indicate that something is wrong with the kidney too, but it also indicates dehydration, right? So B1 is more so for dehydration, but it's, it's still a kidney lab. But creatinine would be that number one kidney lab that you want to look out for, even more so than BUN. It's just that they're usually coupled together. And sometimes it won't even tell you that it's less than 30 mils per hour. It might actually say something like the patient has urinated 240 mils in 12 hours. So what I want you to know about the NCLEX is that they have a calculator at the top left corner of the screen. I want you to click on the calculator whenever it says things like that. And I want you to take that 240 mils and divide that by the amount of hours they gave you, which is 12 and you get 20. That's less than 30. So that's a red flag. So you automatically want to think oligorrhea, okay? If they tell you 240 mils since admission, unless they give you a timeline, like they were admitted at 0800 and now it's uh, 1300, then that's pretty much them implying that there's a timeline. There's eight o'clock all the way till 1 p.m. aka 1300 that's a five hour duration so you want to take those mills and divide it by five in that case which would be 48 which honestly is doable it's greater than that 30 so it's fine and so again back to that question the fact that they mentioned the patient is on a mycin automatically think ear issues and kidney issues and if you see any of those answer options referring to any of the ear issues or kidney issues that i just mentioned choose it because that can lead to drastic complications down the road if you don't address it now and by addressing it now it would mean to stop the mycin infusion because that's the cause so if a patient is ever reacting to a medication being given to them like a really bad side effect and then you want to first stop the source. That's why when we're giving patients blood transfusions, for example, and they start kind of developing a rash or even like sometimes they could get like throat swelling, like they'll start developing that transfusion reaction and you have to stop the blood transfusion and flush them with the 0.9% normal saline. If you're ever giving a patient a blood transfusion, first of all, the identity of the patient plus the compatibility of blood has to be confirmed by two licensed RNs. It cannot be LPNs. It not be UAPs. It has to be two licensed RNs, which happens in the real world. And then for the first 15 minutes, the RN has to stay with the patient. This cannot be delegated to the LPN or the UAP. So if a patient has just, just, just received a blood transfusion, we have to stay with them for the first 15 minutes to monitor their vital signs and to monitor any type of blood transfusion reaction. This cannot be delegated because at this point, that patient potentially could become unstable, right? I think after just the first hour, as long as the patient is okay, that's when we can start to delegate the vital signs to the UAP just to um, continue to monitor the patient's progress. You could only run the blood transfusion with 0.9% normal saline. Anything else is not correct. So I, I once had a question on my practice test. I just want to make that clear because I'm not giving away any NCLEX questions because that's not legal. But on my practice test, it did say that the patient is to receive a blood transfusion. Um, which of the following fluid types are the most appropriate to run with the blood. A, lactated ringers, B, D5W, C, 0.9% normal saline, or D, 0.45% normal saline. So the answer was C. Every single blood transfusion has to be run with 0.9% normal saline. It's just the thing. It's just what it's compatible with. You have to also make sure that there's a Y tubing connected because the Y tubing actually prevents the blood from clotting prior to entering the patient's system. It kind of like filters out the blood so that it doesn't clot when it goes into the patient because imagine sending a blood clot into the patient's system. It's just gonna clot somewhere else in the body, like in their lungs, in their legs, in their brain, and we have a stroke. That's not good. Oh, and another very important thing, you have to run that blood within four hours. It cannot be more than four hours because that blood will start to accumulate bacteria after that four hour mark. The only thing that UAPs can do in this case, by the way, is retrieve the blood from the blood bank and bring it over to the unit for you to confirm with another nurse about. And then after the first hour, the UAP can monitor the vital signs when the patient is deemed stable by the RN. But yeah, that's blood transfusions. I'm not even sure how I got there. <laughs> With delegation, I want you to remember that UAPs can do basic stuff. They're still very important. We need them. We need them. They can do basic stuff in the NCLEX world because it could be different in the real world. But this is just based on the NCLEX. You want to pass, right? So I'm trying to tell you what the NCLEX is expecting of you. So they can bathe. They can do ADLs on stable patients, right? So what does stable really mean? So it's pretty much patients, for example, who have had surgery over 24 hours ago. So if this is one day after surgery and onwards, 
it's like one, two, three, four, five, whatever. If it's after the first day of surgery, then they are deemed as stable. Unless the patient is now reporting new signs and symptoms. Like for example, a patient who just had a hip replacement, total hip arthroplasty is sometimes how they will try to word it. And let's say they are 24 hours post-op, but during that next day, the patient is now reporting shortness of breath. Well, now they're unstable, right? Because now we're looking at a breathing issue and it's a new report, right? If the patient is reporting, it pretty much means that there's now a change in their condition because prior to that, they were once stable, but now they're reporting shortness of breath. So now the RN must come in and assess them because now that patient is deemed as unstable. And with the UAPs, they pretty much can't take care of patients that are unstable. That would be patients with swallowing issues. So again, dryasthenia gravis or myasthenia gravis. They usually have a swallowing issue, which would be called dysphagia with a G. And also stroke patients too. They usually have swallowing issues as well. A person who just had a stroke cannot be seen by a UAP. And I think not even an LPN either. Like they are just deemed as unstable and they need to be seen by the RN. NCLEX might try and trick you and say, which patient can the UAP take care of in this scenario? And it might have options like a patient who needs to walk down the hall within the first eight hours of surgery, B, a patient who needs teaching about how to self-inject insulin, C, a patient who is two days post-op hip replacement who needs to use the bedpan, or D, a patient who has myasthenia gravis and needs feeding. So between all those options, if, if you really wanted to focus Focus on the two that seem like the most possible answer, you'd probably narrow it down to C and D in that case. But the answer here would be C, would be the patient who is two days post-op, right? So that's past the 24-hour mark. So once you're past that 24-hour mark post-op and they're pretty much deemed stable as long as there are no reports of changes in their condition like airway breathing or circulation changes. Because this patient is past that 24 hours and all they need is a bedpan, pretty much deemed a stable patient. And the thing that they need done right now is something that's within the UAP's scope of practice. Now D, feeding, yes, the UAP definitely feeds patient. But a patient with myasthenia gravis, dry asthenia gravis, where they have that dry esophagus, again, I don't know for sure if it's dry or not, but it helps you to remember that myasthenia gravis is dry asthenia gravis, so everything is kind of dry dry with it, you know, droopy eyelid, dry esophagus, so they're gonna have those swallowing issues. But because that's an airway problem, they have to be attended by the RN. So the RN is actually going to have to feed that patient with myasthenia gravis. Same thing for feeding a patient who just had a stroke. Hey guys, so sorry about that, but this video has been going on for a little longer than expected, so I'm gonna have to make a part two, okay? So stay tuned. And always remember, natural hair grows, don't you forget it. Oh, 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 the pretty girl.